Good afternoon, my name is Karine de Meijer. And good afternoon, my name is Milena Piermont. I'm a board member of the World Future Society. And today we are really proud because we are announcing that we are forming the uh, European chapter for the World Future Society. To do so, we will start uh, with a series of uh, very important conversations regarding the future of Europe uh, with some preeminent uh, business leaders and politicians. We are actually standing in front of the platform Beta Technique in The Hague on the Lange Verhout. And here we will be interviewing, amongst others, Dr. Alexander Rinar Khan, who is currently the president of the Social Economical Council. And we will be talking with him about the importance of connecting the public sector to the private sector. Uh, we will also be talking to Dr. Jeroen van der Veer, who is currently the chairman of the platform Beta Technique and who used to be the former CEO of Shell. And with him we will be talking uh, also, amongst others, about the importance of uh, stimulating young people to actually choose the subject of science, because uh, he also thinks that innovation in society really comes forth out of science. Thank you very much, Mr. van der Veer, for uh, accepting to, uh, to help us uh, on the important topic we have uh, on the future of Europe. The World Future Society uh, addresses the leading age of thinking about analyzing, understanding and influencing the future. And in that context, the future of Europe is a very crucial topic for us. So I would like to ask you a few questions regarding um, the future of Europe. And I will start with my first question. Um, how do you look at the world and the future of market capitalism? Do you think it is time for reframing capitalism? How do you perceive the theme? Market capitalism without check and balances is not a good system. So it is all about how you, the, the countervailing powers to direct the market capitalism in the right way. So it is about check and balances. And basically the check and balances are either set by the governments or it is self-policing by the business society. Thank you for joining us this afternoon uh, for the interview on the future of Europe. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask you, as the President of the Social Economic Council, what is your current opinion of what's going on in Europe and the future of the market? You have picked the right time to talk about the future of Europe because all of us, I think, are extremely concerned right now of where we are heading uh, and we think are well aware of the risks and the dangers that we are facing. Uh, I would like to focus on the opportunity that Europe represents and the miracle that it has accomplished already. And in that sense, I continue to be extremely optimistic. I think Europe has delivered extremely well on its historical promises. Uh, now what we need to realize is that going forward, uh, we can only go further down the road that we have traveled on so far and realize that further reforms are essential, that a deepening and widening of the integration process is crucial for Europe's future. To accomplish that uh, it will be complex uh, and demanding, certainly under present day conditions. But what I hope especially is that we will begin by cleaning up the financial sector. And if there is one proposal that would have my immediate support, it is a proposal to create a banking union, an integrated system of uh, supervision and control over Europe's financial sector, including mechanisms for countries to demonstrate their solidarity in coping with the shocks and challenges that the financial sector faces. Uh, that, I think, is uh, the short-term agenda. The longer-term agenda, for me, is a further process of political integration on top of economic integration, further intensification of what we have accomplished in the field of sustainability, and a further realization of the fact that Europe cannot just be an economic union, it also has to be a social union, and at the end of the day, it has to be a community of values. Europe is in a crisis at this moment. Uh, how would you describe the crisis in Europe? And is it a Euro crisis? Is it a Euro crisis system? Is it a crisis of the system itself? Or is it a crisis of another European country? In fact, people talk about the Euro crisis. In itself, the Euro is not in a crisis. But it is those countries who have joined the Euro, they and some of those countries did not realize that if you give up the devaluation tool, of your local currency, that you miss an essential tool for adaption uh, if something goes wrong in your economy. And what we have forgotten is that joining the euro, uh, 
hindsight wisdom, but it is now very clear that it needed more integration of the economic and fiscal policies and oversight of the banks. So basically it is a system of the country, uh, basically it is a problem of the countries who have the euro. And the only way to come out is basically twofold. First of all, you need short-term actions, as basically done is by the heads of the, the governments or the ministers of finance, that are short-term actions, because in some country or in some sector is a, a direct need to do something. But that will not bring, the, the short-term actions will not bring the lasting solution. You have to combine that with stronger European institutions, for instance, a European oversight of the banks. This is the report of Mr. La Rochere. And, but that, again, more is that is needed. And that is, for instance, more integration between the economic policies and what Brussels can do and cannot do if some uh, budget deficits in countries start to, to go up. Um, what's the role of the Netherlands in this, uh, in this idea I mean, that, that you're talking about? I mean, the Netherlands has benefited like no other country, I think, even uh, from European integration. We have a long tradition as a trading nation. We are one of the most open economies of the world. The sum of imports and exports in the Netherlands exceeds our national product. We are truly a gateway to Europe for many nations that want to do business with the continent. And so our role, I think, should be to in the forefront further integration. We realize, like no other people does, that European integration is the path to the future for this small country within Europe. Mm -hmm. There's very little that we can accomplish on our own, but there's a lot that we can accomplish as an active member of a vital political community. What do, um, do you think is, is a challenge for the Netherlands in this uh, role of actually uh, solving the Euro crisis? I, th I, th I think that uh, the Netherlands has been uh, very active, maybe sometimes even close to be too active. And they, they, they made the impression that everything would be fine and dandy in our, in our country. And I think as it has, uh, as it has happened, uh, our position was, is, is not very bad, but it is not as it good as it could be. So I think it is much more about cooperation and to show what you can do on your own role, than as we, the, the good Dutch expression is, that to be the person with the little finger uh, uh, to other people. And I think that applies in general. Uh, of course, you need a strong hand, in this case from Brussels, but not every country which is in difficulty like to be lectured by every other country who, who thinks that they are not in difficulty. Uh in, in your view, what kind of roles can governments, corporations and households need to play in order to actually overcome the crisis that we are in right now? And what would be, to your liking, the uh, desirable uh, relationship between the government uh, and the market? We are still living in the aftermath of, let's say, at least one financial crisis, according to a few people, even more than just one. But it all started when uh, there was an, an overload of debt in the world economy. And that debt, which was originally private debt, has now become public debt as a result of government intervention. We should be grateful to governments for intervening in the way they did. If they had not done it, the crisis would be even worse than it already is. But now, of course, the public debt has to be cleaned up and cleared away. And that is the process that we are in the middle of. Uh, and that implies a very demanding mixture of austerity and budget control on one hand and growth uh, encouraging policies on the other hand. At the end of the day, the problem of Europe is a divergence in competitiveness between the northern countries and the southern countries. Uh, and at the end of the day, as a result, we can only resolve Europe's problems by charting a path to growth, especially for the southern European countries. It is the only way for them to make sure that they can get the fresh start that they deserve. So governments need to do two things. They need to get their own budgets under control, and in some countries they are hugely out of control. And at the same time, they need to make sure that a process of economic reforms uh, gets growth uh, on the track again and ensures that the future of the weaker European nations is one that is dictated by what growth can do for them. The last year, I think one of the big issues was the Occupy movement. Um, 
Do you think that that was all about the uh, yeah about uh, the excesses of uh, capitalism, or I mean, what is the what is your assessment about this? No, Occupy mainly uh, played a role in the United States and Europe, and I think that. If, and, uh, and I took efforts to try to talk and to listen especially to those people. And you get a kind of feeling it was against the, the banks, it was against globalization. And as far as they have thought about solutions, then it is usually to be more domestic, uh, to be more on their own. And I think, uh, why is that? Because those people, they have problems to see the advantages of a more international world. And they don't realize how it has benefited basically all or nearly all people. And the second point is, they, those people who are in the Occupy movement, they are not readers of the Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal. They think that they should get the complexities of the world explained by tweets on Twitter. And I'm afraid to say that, yeah, it is very good to, to explain the complexity of the worlds in a simple way, but to do that in tweets on Twitter, I think that may be a too big challenge. Uh, so the basis of the understanding of Occupy is not seeing the advantages of the international world. And the solution, of course, is that uh, politicians, but people from companies or normal citizens, do more efforts to give insight what this international world uh, has brought as advantages to most of us. The last question that you uh, wanted to uh, comment on is uh, how do you see the future of European uh, multinationals and will they be able to compete with well, companies you know, or like countries like China and India or Brazil or Russia? Um, so, I mean, what is your advice on that? Um, in a world uh, where governance uh, still is regulated at best at national or continental, but certainly not at global level, multinational companies fulfill an increasingly important role and carry many responsibilities that were previously assigned to states. Uh, and that in itself uh, already indicates their enormous importance to the future of the world economy. In the Netherlands, we've always been very active to ensure that these multinational corporations do not just see themselves as the creators of economic prosperity, but also as the uh, responsible parties in ensuring a world that is not just economically prosperous, but also sustainable and socially viable. And so corporate social responsibility uh, has always played a very important role in our national debates. Right now, I'm in the middle of an initiative which tries to ensure that multinational corporations play an important international role in this domain as well. And basically, the Dutch multinational corporations have committed themselves to ensuring that the this complete supply chain that they work with, the complete international supply chain that they depend on, over time will develop standards both socially and ecologically that live up to the Dutch current standards of today. That is a very ambitious goal, but I'm happy to say that we are making significant progress and that also as a result of Dutch lobbying, the OECD guidelines to multinational organizations now very much reflect that creed and belief. And so I'm optimistic about progress that we can make in the coming years. And also optimistic that multinational corporations beyond the Netherlands will join us in ensuring a better and safer and more sustainable world. Talking about the Occupy movement, we're actually talking about younger people in Europe. I mean, and what are their future perspectives? So uh, from that uh, angle, what is your special advice to the governments in Europe? the civil servants and EU officials on the European uh, economy? The art is to keep Europe competitive in the, in the world, in the international world. And I take the international world as a given, otherwise uh, we will lose anyway. So we should be part of the total system. If you then look at the key problems in Europe, is that first of all, young people don't take up enough technical and science studies. Example for the Netherlands, but quite representative for Europe, two out of ten young people go to a kind of technical college or science college or university or vocational training. Probably optimal for society is four out of ten, which is still lower than some Asian countries. So we have to influence our education system 
uh, that more people take up technical and science studies. Is, is that enough? No. Because you see that to get enough innovation in Europe, we have set the Lisbon norm on 3% of GDP. I think that's about the right number. But again, most countries are quite a way short of this 3%. So you need to have the people and then you have to make sure that companies get, uh, our incentives, uh, get incentives to do more research and development here. By the way, I do not believe in handouts by governments, but I do believe in good fiscal policies to attract research here. And so governments should not see themselves as handout machines, but as entities who govern their society to the optimal way, to the optimal balance for the future, be it education, be it the fiscal climate. Now, and I think that civil servants and politicians can much, do much more on those two subjects, and then we have a better European society who can stand the competition uh, in the international world.